but he thought he was direct mathematics to the 20th century. And he wasn't completely right, but he did have a lot of it right. So this was the first one solved, it was solved in fact the very next year. And uh, before actually saying what the problem is, I'm going to do a smaller case that leads to the problem. So, question. Can all polygons be dissected into a finite number of polygons and then rearranged into a square? So you can think of so you can think of this problem as a question of how do we find the areas of polygons? Like it's it's not a very easy question to ask a triangle and a square. So if you're really nice to find polygons, just cut it up, rearrange it into a square, and then compute the area of the square, because these operations preserve area. So for instance, uh, if you have a uh, right triangle with sides one and two, you can cut it across the medial line here. And, sort of, and fold the top triangle down to get a square. The best is we do this with any polygon. It doesn't have to be complex. So we don't know anything about it. Can we do anything? And the answer is, in fact, yes. Uh, you can. And I'm going to be explaining how to do it in a second. But in addition, what this means is that if we have any two polygons in the same area, we can cut one up in some way and rearrange it into the other one. So in particular, instead of solving this exact problem, we can just say, OK, well, given any two polygons, can we rearrange one to the other one? Um, and that's, in fact, the way to solve this, because it ends up being slightly easier than actually trying to get it into a square. Um, so we do this in a couple of steps. First, we show that any triangle can be rearranged into a rectangle. And then we show that any two rectangles can be arranged into one another. Now, this is enough because what we can do with any polygon is we can cut it up into triangles in some way. Uh, and then we can rearrange each of those triangles into a rectangle whose side length is one of whose side lengths is one. Then we can put all those triangles together into a big rectangle and change that rectangle into a square. And of course, if we have two, two polygons in the same area, we can arrange each of them into a square, we can only arrange them into one another. So now we just have these two much simpler problems to look at, triangles and rectangles. So first, triangle to rectangle. Uh, so we have some triangle ABC. And uh, we want to reduce it to something with right angles, so we draw an altitude. Now we want this altitude to lie completely inside the triangle because if it intersects that side, if it outlines that side of the triangle, we can't cut the triangle along it. So that's why we take the largest angle. Um, so then we take this altitude and we take the medial line uh, perpendicular to it, which is the line containing connecting the midpoints of the two sides. Um, and we cut along all three lines and we pull the two top triangles down onto the two bottom ones so we get this rectangle. Um, and it's pretty obvious why it ends up being a rectangle. Um, so clearly we can do this with any triangle. And so now we, we reduce this to the case of just looking at rectangles. So the rectangles case is actually slightly more difficult. Um, so I'm going to explain this picture because it's, it's vaguely complicated. So we have two rectangles of equal area. We have this blue rectangle here and a green rectangle here. And we want to rearrange them into one another. So it turns out that there are two cases. So we connect this, we take this long black line, which is the, connects the sort of the outside vertices. And the, there's a case where it falls inside the smaller rectangle, the way it does in this picture. And there's also obviously the case when it falls outside and when the two rectangles are both very long and very skinny. Um, so I will only do this case because the other case is much, much easier and it can be reduced to this case. And for an exercise, you can figure out how to do this, but it's really not very difficult. Um, but this is the interesting case because it's really not obvious how you cut these two up. So first off, a few things to notice. Uh, if we draw these three lines, that I drew in black, um, they're parallel. And the way you can figure this out is from the fact that these two areas are equal, you can get that this, this triangle, this triangle, and this triangle are similar. And then because you eat on each of them, you have two sides that are parallel, you get the third side that's also parallel. Um, 
And so I'm going to draw some views of parallel. And uh, we also know that all that uh, the horizontal and vertical lines are parallel not to one another, of course. And uh, so from that, we get two facts. Uh, we get that these three red triangles all, are all congruent and they have the same area. And we also get that, so I, I put them as blue dots and green dots. This big triangle and this big triangle are congruent. So in particular, this gives us exactly the way to rearrange these two rectangles. We take this red triangle and move it down, and we take this big triangle and move it down. And so we've cut, we can, we can move the parts of the blue rectangle around to make the green rectangle. So this shows for one set of case and the other case that says before can be reduced to this case. So now I've pretended to show that uh, we can rearrange any rectangle to any other rectangle. Uh, and you can fill in all the holes. So now we come to Hilbert's third problem. So we've solved we've solved polygons. A polygon if we consider two polygons equivalent, we can cut one up and rearrange it into the other one, then all polygons of the same area are equivalent. So in particular, uh, if we consider dissections and rearrangements to be, you know, all the equivalents that we care about, all polygons are equivalent of the area. So the obvious next question is, is this, the same? Is this true of polyhedra? Um, and so we have this question, can all polyhedra be dissected into a finite number of polyhedra and then rearrange them? Cube. This once again is going to be And the answer is in fact no, which is kind of unexpected because for polygons the answer is yes. Um, and uh, and so the question is why not? And can we figure out something else? So clearly there's some other information which there isn't poly in polyhedra that isn't there in polygons. So so we're looking for an invariant that is preserved by dissection and rearrangement, such as volume. Um, uh, and it has to have some other information in also. So this the invariant that uh, is now solved is called, called den invariant. Um, and the idea of it is the following. So what information do we have about polyhedra that we don't really have in polygons? Well, we have uh, the angles at the, at the edges. Which are really sort of which are the three-dimensional thing that you would think would make it difficult to rearrange poly polyhedra because it's because it's difficult to to cut them to make the angles the way you want them, the way you want them to be. So this is in fact what goes wrong, and I'm going to outline how to find the den invariant. So it's kind of hard just to figure out an invariant off the top. Um, so, first we're going to make a guess um, as to what the important information is. And our guess, which is right, because we already have the solution as of about 100 years ago, but, you know, if we were trying to figure it out, we might guess uh, that we want it to depend on the edges and on the angles at every edge. So at every edge of polyhedron, you have two planes coming together, and there's an angle between the planes. Those are the angles that we're worried about. Um, so suppose that we have a polyhedron with p edges, and at the ith edge, uh, whose length is a i, uh, we have the angle alpha i between the two points. So we're going to say, well, we're going to say that the invariant looks something like this for some function of the angles, because it just looks like it's possible. So we're hoping that this works. So in particular, why does a function that looks like this, why do we like the look of this function? So the first thing to notice is that it, it properly scales with edge lengths. We really want the function to be linear in terms of each edge length. Because if, for instance, we put two cubes together like this, we want it to not be the same as each of the cubes separately. So we can't have something that just depends on the angles. Because, you know, this cube and this cube each have the same angles, they're different from the rectangular prism. So we want something that depends on the edge length as well as the angles. Um, and we also, but we want it to be that when we stretch an edge and don't change the angle, it, it stretches linearly, which is exactly the property we have here. So in particular now, we want 
figure out what properties F needs to have. So what properties does F need to have? Um, so now we're going to worry about angles. So we take a polyhedron and we, we look at how angles change. So suppose we have two polyhedrons and two cubes in the previous slide that you can't see anymore. Uh, and we put them together. So actually, let's put this back so we can solve that. We can look at this prism in two ways. The first way is it's two cubes put together. And the second is as one big rectangular prism. Now, we want it to be the case that if we take the invariant of this cube and of this cube and we add them up, we get the big one. This is what I was talking about when I said the scale of properties edgeways. But in addition, if we look at this edge here in the middle of the of the column, you know, we want it to be as if that edge didn't exist. So if we take that, if we take the sum of the functions around that edge of f of the angle, we want it to add up to zero. Because adding just some random edge in the middle of a in the middle of the face shouldn't change your invariant. Um, if you so, and in particular, if we say put another two cubes on top of this, now this would be in the middle of the polyhedron. And in that case, also, we want it to be the case that the function adds up to zero. Because it also should be as if that edge just didn't exist. So, now we look at this picture. So, we look, so we've cut the polyhedron perpendicular to an edge. And we're just looking around that edge, you know, the polyhedron. And we have three polyhedra that we've put together somehow to form that edge. So, so since we want this, the invariant of the, of the big polyhedra, which I drew in black, to be the sum of the smaller polyhedra, which I drew in blue except for the edges of the black one, uh, we want the angles to add up properly. So in particular, we want the function of, of the sum of the angles, which is the function of the big angle, to be the sum of the functions of the angles. So uh, this is called the function being additive. If you have two things that are added and you, you separate them, you get and uh, then you get that the function of the sum is, is the sum of the functions of the set. In addition, we want an angle, an angle that's where pi is not intense. Pi or two pi or three pi, so that's what you get this, this top part. Um, because if we say, well, this is, you know, we look back at this cube again, if we say, well, actually, this big prism is a big polyhedron. It just has these edges around it. You know, and, and instead of having eight edges, it has 12 edges. Uh, sorry, instead of having eight vertices, it has 12 vertices because we claim that in the middle of the side there are also vertices. Well, we don't want those vertices to count. So we want that pi to be zero. Um, and it turns out that this is enough that you can prove that uh, if you have a function that has these properties, then if you take a bunch of polyhedron and put them together with a big polyhedron, uh, then the invariant of the big one will equal to some of the invariants of the small ones. And the way you show this is, uh, is you look at each bit of edge in the middle. You take a look at all of the, the vertices, and you look at all of the edges in the middle. And you and you look around all of them and you notice that those edges don't count. At, because that the sum of functions is zero around them. And you look at the outside and you notice that some of the uh, that the some of the of the some of the, the little functions around the edges would be the sum the big one. And there is the big polyhedron. And so uh, it turns out that you have this property. So in particular, if we have a bunch of small polyhedra and we put them together in one way, and we put them together in another way, uh, you still get, you get the same invariant, which is exactly what we want. But this isn't really exactly what we wanted, because we wanted to position to be able to show something with this. In particular, we wanted to be able to show that we have polyhedra with distinct den invariants, because this would all kind of be useless if, it didn't, if volume was good enough. Uh, we want to show that this encodes information that 
uh, that isn't included in volume. So here's a fact which, I mean, it's a bit of a pain to prove, but it's, it's not that difficult. So uh, no integer of multiple of cosine inverse of one third is an integer multiple of pi. Um, why do we care? Well, we care about this because it means that we can define f. Um, technically, on the real numbers, we only really care about the angles of the polyhedra, so that f of pi over 2 is f of pi is 0, and f of cosine inverse of 1 third is 1. Why do we need this fact? We have the additivity criterion that if a bunch of angles add up to another angle, then f of that angle has to be the sum of f. If there was some integer multiple of cosine inverse of one third that was an integer multiple of pi, this would mean that f of cosine inverse of one third needs to be zero. Um, because we could have uh, that, we know that f of any multiple of pi is zero, so f of this integer multiple of cosine of negative one third would have to be zero. So since I'm just a multiple of f of cosine inverse of one third, it's going, we're going to say, it's going to have to be zero. But it's not, which this fact states. So that means we can define it to be one. And there's a sort of vaguely subtle issue about, you know, can we do this? Can we extend this function to the real numbers, uh, to all of the real numbers? But you actually don't need to worry about it. You can define these functions just on the angles that appear in your polyhedra. And then when you when you cut a polyhedron up, you need to talk about extending the function to the other angles. But Really, it's not something to worry about. It all works out. So this is a valid function. And also, if you uh, if you've taken linear algebra, you can say that you can extend uh, pi over two and cosine inverse uh, of one third of uh, to uh, q bases of r, and then you just define this as a linear function of q on r. Um, but you don't keep it really easy. So once again, I'm just See, so we can look at the following two polyhedra. On one hand, we have a cube. And on the other hand, we have a regular tetrahedra. Now, why do we want the regular cosine inverse of one third? Because, in fact, the, the angle between the, any two sides of a regular tetrahedra is exactly cosine inverse of one third. So in particular, we can compute uh, the invariance of the cube which is going to be, so there are 12 edges, so it's going to be 12 times f of pi over 2, which is 0. Whereas when we compute this one, it's going to be 6 times f of cosine inverse of 1 third, which is 6, which is not even 0. So we now have two polyhedra, which have different dead invariants. So in particular, this means that the regular tetrahedron can't be rearranged into a cube. Um, and so just some things that I wanted to mention as I was saying this up. So there's this question of congruency. What does it mean to rearrange things in free space? If we're talking about rearranging polygons, we're allowed to reflect them. And <coughs> well, that's fine because you can always reflect polygons. But when you start talking about polyhedras, people start hedging. Some people say, of course you can reflect them, because otherwise it's not, it's not analysis two-dimensional case, and other people say, no, we're talking about three dimensions, you can't reflect. Uh, in this problem, it doesn't matter. Because it turns out that, supposing that you can dissect something so that uh, you can rearrange in something else using reflections, then it turns out that you can sub-dissect it into pieces that all have a plane of symmetry. Now, obviously, once you reflect, each of these things with a plane of symmetry is not changed after a reflection. So in particular, if you can rearrange something using reflections, you can also rearrange something <coughs> using 